thing so that you can bring it in. But I would uh, really like you all to stand and just you know, come down the center aisles and put your offering in here. We'll take a check, we'll take a change, whatever you have. Um, this goes for a great cause. A great cause. So right now, with all of the uh, destruction we have around the world, uh, churches and buildings are just needed greatly. And your offering is going to go and help uh, working witness teams to build those buildings and uh, get them back on their feet and show everyone around the world that we are still present in the world. So, I'd like to say a short prayer and then we'll have come down the center aisle. And just for the exercise, just walk if you don't even have anything. That's fine too. <laughs> okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you today. We thank you so much for the many things that you do around the world for us. We thank you for the missionaries that are out there that are trying to spread the word to everyone that they can see, dear Lord. And to even those that they can't by radio or internet, whatever, dear Lord. We just pray that you'll keep your hands upon them, dear Lord, that you'll keep them safe. And we know many of them are in dangerous areas. We just thank you so much, dear Lord, for what you give us. And I just pray, dear Lord, that we're able to give back to you for this needed purpose. So we thank you, dear Lord, for each and every one that is here. And we bless you today.
called the great I am. And I was thinking this morning on my way into church of the story back in the Old Testament as, as Moses was being called by the Lord. And he said to the Lord, well, when they asked me who sent me to tell them this, what am I supposed to tell them? And God said, I am what I am. Tell them I am the same. And I was thinking that, you know, when, I, when I'm at work and I ask someone for something, I may or may not get it. But if I go to them and I say, hey, Vice President so-and-so says, I need to have this, I get it pretty quickly. And we have someone who is so much greater than a Vice President of the company. Amen. Someone who's greater than a king or a prime minister or a president of any country. The Lord our God, who is the great I Am, has sent us into this world and says, I want the lives of the people in this world. Will you stand as we continue to praise the Lord this morning?
children of honor dismissed from children's church if they haven't already gone out. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, let the prayer of our heart be the food of the to be a sanctuary. The one and all. Our altars are open. your words before the Lord this morning, or if you want to come and give your praise and glory as the great and almighty God, or if you want to lift up the burdens of another, it's a pleasure to come. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Sutherland comes to us from 
from Olivet Nazarene University as part of the Preaching Ambassador Program. And I, I don't want to tell you too much about him because I think he's very capable of introducing himself. So I'm going to hand, hand it over to Jimmy. Would you welcome
what I ended up discovering was that if I start laughing, it makes it worse. Because it ends up, I'm, I end up like my dad, then I'm laughing at my own jokes. So just drown out my own laughing, please laugh for me. Uh, the second thing is that I want you to know is that I, I tend to not yell a lot. Uh, you, just a forewarning, you know, some uh, preachers that you'll hear for our, one of our preaching ambassador retreats a number of years ago now, uh, we had one minister start in reading some scripture verses, and so I'm down like this. It's like 9.30 in the morning, exhausted. And so I'm down like this, and he finishes the verse, and I'm like, okay, okay. And then he starts yelling, just out of nowhere. I, I, I tend to stay in this little ballpark right here. I don't get too soft, I don't get too loud. I'm just right in this little ballpark so you guys know that. And if you fall asleep, odds are it probably won't wake you up. So neighbors, be aware with those elbow nudges, okay? The third thing that you should know, and I, I normally am able to pull up my socks and show, show my dinosaur sh or shark, shark socks. Shark socks. To prove, uh, I am, I, I'm kind of on the younger side, I'm aware of that. I grew facial hair to hide that as much as possible. Uh, but I am 22 years old. And with that, uh, I, I am very tempted to say naive 22 year old things at times, for better or for worse. Uh, there's also a temptation, I think, oftentimes to view uh, what I say then as words of a 22-year-old. And so as a reminder to myself as well as to us as we go through the sermon today, I will do my very best, I promise, to not sound 22 as much as possible. Uh, and let's just trust that God will speak through me this morning and that uh, you can get around the 22-year-oldness and allow God to speak to your heart and not just be this morning. And so with that, we'll pray before we get started. Dear God, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. May the words that I share be your words and not my own. And may you just speak through me. May you open up the minds and ears and hearts of those who are here today that may, they may hear your word. And at any point, if I think there would be something really cool to say, and it is my own thought and not yours, uh, may you just take that thought and throw it away. Because right now, for these next few minutes, the most important thing is that we hear the message that you would have intended for us. I have a certain direction that I think this sermon is supposed to go and, and that you've led me in, but if you take it a whole other direction, may you do so. If there is somebody who's struggling with something different than what I'm preaching on and you're working something in their life, may they just be able to hold, just totally ignore the sermon and listen to you. Because it doesn't matter what words are shared right now, but that your spirit comes and dwells among us and teaches us right now. And so for these next few moments, open up our minds, our ears, our hearts to you, what you would have for us to learn. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I'm talking to Pastor Ryan ahead of time. He told me you guys normally get out about 1, 1 1.30 p.m. So I have, <laughs> I have prepared my two-hour sermon for today. Uh, just kidding. I promise not to take too long. I come from a family of ministers, though. Dad's a minister. Both grandpas are a minister. I don't know if I kept caught on to the long-windedness of them, but it, it's close. My uh, dad would often have my grandpa fill in at local churches uh, that my dad would be pastoring at. And I remember one time we were traveling and we were on our way back. It was a Sunday night. And uh, we got a text two hours after the start of the Sunday night service, which normally goes about 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, there's a text saying, hey, your grandpa or your dad just finished. And lo and behold, my grandpa went on for an hour and a half preaching on a Sunday night service. No idea how. Normally an hour long service, he goes an hour and a half just with preaching and 30 minutes of music. No idea how, but that's him. So I, I promise not to do that tonight, though. Uh, but where we're going to be at today, we are going to be going out of the book of Jonah. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, you're more than welcome to. Uh, and to provide a little bit of context for Jonah, the first time we hear about him isn't in the book of Jonah, actually. It's in the book of 2 Kings in chapter 14, verse 25. And I'm not going to read that for you today. Uh, but just to tell you what's going on, what is essentially happening is that Jonah is serving as a prophet for the nation of Israel while, nation is un while Israel is under the rule of King Jeroboam II. And really, uh, under King Jeroboam II's reign, the nation is growing to become the largest and most powerful it had been in almost 200 years since the time of King Solomon's reign, honestly. And while they were growing and becoming more powerful, they honestly, honestly were becoming no closer to God in the midst of this. So this is where we take off. And if you're in the book of Jonah, we're going to be picking right through it. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and 
headed for Tarsus. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarsus to flee from the Lord. And so we see right here from the beginning, Jonah not only doesn't like this call, says, mm -mm, not doing this. Uh, he doesn't just call it quits. He runs away. He's going the complete opposite direction. I don't have a map up, but if I were to show you a map, you'd see Nineveh and you'd see Tarsus. He's going that way, said no, um, to that way. So he's going the complete opposite direction. But then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Uh, all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they, they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. And then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast the lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And what we see in this, and as it wraps up with chapter 1, where basically there's no other option except to throw Jonah overboard and a great fish falls him up. But what we see is that no matter how hard we try to get away from God, God will always find a way to come after us. He chases after us like a father chases after his own son. And we see that right here in Jonah as he's saying, you want to go that way? Nah, you're coming back this way. And we're, I will read uh, chapter 2, but we see Jonah's prayer in chapter 2 where he uh, cries out to God for forgiveness, talking about how he uh, uses the words uh, from the depths of the grave, I call for help and you listen to my cry. Where we have this longing for Jonah, where he is repentant, where he's ready to go. And we see it in the last verse, verse 10, where this change of heart happens and the Lord responds and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And so Jonah is back to Nineveh, and that's where we catch up in chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Uh, a couple other verses in there talk about how the news reached the king of Nineveh. He issues a decree. This change is happening from the greatest with the kings to the least with the cattle. There is repentance. They're done with this. And we see that in verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they repented, and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. And what we see from this is that no matter how far somebody may get from God, God is capable of bringing them back and forgiving them. Not just people, not just individuals, not just groups of people, but an entire nation. We'll hear the number for this people later to be uh, 120,000 people. Now, if God can bring back even one of those, that's incredible. But not only does he repent, lead one person to back to him, but he leads 120,000 people back to him. God is capable of redeeming those who are lost, no matter how lost they may be. And I wish... Wish. Chapter 3 would be the end of the book of Jonah. We would just stop there, close it. That's the, that's the bedtime story. Like, man, 120,000 people repented. That's a good one. We can go home now. Great joy. We'll see you later. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Unfortunately, we have chapter 4. <laughs> Unfortunately. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And from my understanding, uh, this is the first time and only time that I know of when somebody complains to God about being compassionate and forgiving and merciful. He's like, you know what, you're these things and I hate it right now. Like, what are you doing? Only time in the Bible I think I've heard this happen. <laughs> now, O oh Lord, he responds, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at the place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it to grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn, the next day, 
God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And we're just left with this question mark. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And I don't like ending things on question marks. I don't like being left with this, well, what are we supposed to do? And so what I want to do in these next few moments is take what I think Jonah should have learned. If, if Jesus was able to teach to Jonah, here are the three things that I think Jesus would have taught Jonah. And we're going to do that through three parables, actually. And uh, since I like putting things in order as well, I kind of added names to them. And so what we have from these three points is we have the Great Commandment, the Great Commandment, the Great Compassion, and the Great Commission. And we'll begin with the Great Commandment. And, and the parable that I use to represent this is the Good Samaritan. It takes place in Luke 10, 25-37. I'm not going to read that uh, just to provide a little bit of context. Here's what's kind of going on in the passage, though. So we see uh, Jesus is teaching, and a Pharisee comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, Jesus responds, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. One thing I was taught this past week and reminded of in some of my classes was that this was one command. This wasn't Jesus kind of being smart and adding like a 1A, 1B. It's like, no, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because that first part leads right into the second part. And you can't have the first part without the second part. And I've honestly learned it's really hard to love your neighbor if you don't have the first part of that as well. <laughs> Those Ohio State fans, I tell you. Anyways. <laughs> I'm from Indianapolis. I just think it, it, it's a bad I, I was watching football last night, you know. I was, I was sitting there watching football, and uh, it was Michigan and Purdue, and you're like, now what do you do? <laughs> now, I, I don't think I had to do this, but uh, you're, you're done. <laughs> Jimmy, did you know that I'm from Columbus, Ohio? I apologize. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you mentioned Mount Vernon. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Anyways. Uh, that was a little bit I got. You didn't right. provide me enough background ahead of time. Uh huh. Is that my, that's my problem. All right. Hey, you keep going. You keep going. Okay. I'm just sitting here trying to listen to the sermon. All right. Hold on. We'll, we'll preach next week in about college football being greater than God. But, anyways. <laughs> sitting last night watching the Michigan-Purdue game and uh, somebody looks at me and they're like, so who do you cheer for for, for for football? And I'm like, here's the deal. You're from Indiana. You got two options. You either suffer through with IU or you're one of those just kind of fans who watches IU for basketball and Notre Dame for football. I'm like, I just suffer through with IU. And they asked, what about Purdue? I said, Purdue's just kind of there, so it, you don't worry about that. But anyways, <laughs> parable of the Good Samaritan. We'll get back here. And so what we see is that Jesus responds then after the Pharisee looks at him and says, okay, we got this greatest commandment. Okay, but who is my neighbor? Who is it that I am supposed to love in this way? And so Jesus says, okay, listen up. Here we go. Parable of the Good Samaritan. And he says this. Uh, there was a man going along this road, and all of a sudden he was mugged. He was mugged, left for dead, essentially. And as he, after he's mugged, he's left for dead, while well, a priest walks by and simply does nothing. He keeps on walking. A Levite walks by, and, well, he, he does nothing either. He, he just keeps walking. But then a Samaritan, and once again, you have to realize a Samaritan in this culture was like, the Ohio State fans, okay. Like a, Samaritan was like, a Samaritan was the enemy. A Samaritan was the person that you just, you did not deal with, you were done with them, no. Hands washed, enemies, they're done. You don't put up with them. Or for Ohio State fans, Michigan fans, that out there. Anyways, you don't deal with Samaritans. Samaritans are the enemy. Samaritans are the, they have this long feud going back with the Samaritans. Like, you don't mess with them. That's, no, you don't mess with that. And, and then Jesus tells a story. The Samaritan comes in, though, to this Israelite man, and all of a sudden, 
This Samaritan does everything within his power to tend to this Israelite. He picks him up. He, he carries him back to this innkeeper. He tells the innkeeper, hey, here's all that I have for money right now. Uh, and if this isn't enough to take care of him, if this isn't enough to provide for the expenses that are going to come from caring for him, I'll come back. I'll give you even more money. Take care of this man. He's, he's mine. I want to take care of him. And what I think Jonah could have learned from this is that God calls us to love all people unconditionally, no matter what, no matter how crazy they may be. The second thing that I think Jonah could have learned from Jesus' parable uh, comes from uh, the, great or the great compassion, is what I've called it. And for this, we're going to look at the parable of the prodigal son, which takes place in Luke 15, 11 through 32. Once again, I'm not going to read all this, but to provide some context of what's happening. Uh, the, basically, there are two guys, two sons and a father. And the younger son of the two goes to the father and says, Dad, I'm ready for my inheritance. I'm going to... I'm just kind of done. Let's do this. Give me my money. And he gets the inheritance from his father, runs away. Runs away and just squanders all his wealth. Just spends it. Spend, 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 spend. Gone. And all of a sudden, this younger son finds himself without any money, working for pigs. And he becomes so hungry, and he's so poor, he can't buy anything, but he sees the food that pigs are eating. And he says, wow, that looks really good. My wife and I just started to diet a couple days ago. I've been... Understand the feeling. Looked at a cheeseburger the other day. I was like, wow, that's good. But he's just staring at this food. He wants it so bad. And he, he comes to his senses, though. And he comes to his senses and realizes, I'm not eating pig stuff. Like, that's disgusting. Comes to his senses and he says, okay, I'm going to I'm going to go back to my dad. I'm going to apologize. I'll fall at his feet. I will just ask for forgiveness. Maybe, maybe if I'm lucky, he'll make me a servant. His servants eat better than this. They don't have to eat this pig stuff. Like, I will just go back, be a servant, I will be okay. And as he goes back, he is met by his father where he's at. The father runs after him and says, we're throwing a feast right now. Throws a robe around him, gives him uh, the, the crest ring, I think it was, that he puts on his hand. And says, we're going to throw a party because my son was once gone, but now he's back. And this is another passage where it would be really good if it just ended right there. Boom, close the Bible, shut, go home. Woo! But it doesn't. And we're given verses 28 through 32 of the response of the older son. It goes for the older brother. And it goes like this. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you have never gave me, given me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fat calf. My son, the father said, you were always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And what Jonah could have learned from this is that no matter what happens, no matter how wrong someone may be, we are called to forgive all people unconditionally. Amen. And the worst thing ever is that, and I can understand this older brother a little bit because it, it feels personal. It's like, older brother, is like, he didn't just run away from you, he ran away from me. I think about two sons, I got a younger brother who uh, is about four and a half years older than me. He ended up being my best man at my wedding. His, his best man speech brought me to tears, not going to lie. He did a great job. Uh, but I think about the closest that I have with my brother. And if there were ever to be a time, he would run away and just say, I'm done with this family. How, how hurt I would be, how I would feel wrong. And it's like, you know what, Dad, you may be able to forgive him, but you don't understand what he did to me. And I'm, I, I fear that's what we can get stuck in. I fear that's what Jonah got stuck in. Where he's like, God, you don't know how they wrong me, and so you may be able to forgive them, but, I can't. but God calls us to forgive all people unconditionally. And the third and final point that Jonah could have learned from Jesus, uh, which I have titled the Great Commission, and we won't go to Matthew 28, 19 through 20 for this, but I had to use another parable because stay with the consistency. But I think it's best represented in Matthew 25, 31 through 46 which we will read for this one. It goes like this. It's a parable of the sheep and the goats. And the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him. He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by My Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, 
and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, and Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, uh, but the righteous to eternal life. And what I think Jonah could have learned from this is that God calls us to serve and witness to all people. And the greatest example of this, I think, was actually in Jesus' life when the disciples asked him, you know, how can we be great in the kingdom? How can we lead? How can we, we want to be great. And he picks up a towel, he grabs a basin of water, and he begins to wash their feet. He says, if you want to be great, if you want to lead, if, if you want to do something for my kingdom, serve these people. And when we hear the Great Commission, I think it's a call to service. I think it's a call to go and wash the feet of the people around us. To serve those people. So what Jonah could have learned is that no matter how crazy people may be, no matter what the situa situation may be, that God calls us to serve all people unconditionally. In preparing for this sermon, I read a few commentaries. And one of the commentaries basically got to the source of the problems that Jonah was dealing with. And, and gave two things for kind of Jonah's problems with these. And the two, two things that defined Jonah were selfish patriotism and religious bigotry. He said, at the heart of this, this book, at these challenges, these are the two things that Jonah just doesn't get. Selfish patriotism, religious bigotry. And what I fear is that we as a church may struggle with those two things as well a little bit. And I know I am one of the greatest victims and uh, perpetrators of selfish patriotism. I remember, so I got my call at age uh, 10 to ministry. And I remember at 13, sitting as a missionary came and spoke and talking about how uh, great uh, the mission work was in, was happening in Africa, how great it was going, and how by 2020, with the growth, growth Africa was experiencing, and how fast the word was spreading, that by 2020, Africa was set to have more Christians than America. 13-year-old me, that was like, oh, we're going. I was like, so ready for ministry. I think I might have rolled up my sleeves after looking at the paper that showed these numbers. And I was like, hmm, just wait. We're going to get into ministry. We're bringing America back. We're going to pass Africa again if they pass us in 2020. Like, I am so jacked up for America to have the most Christians in the world. And I look back on that and I'm like, what in the world was I thinking? How can I get so caught up that it's more important for there to be more American Christians than there are Christians in Africa? How can I get so caught up worrying about the kingdom of America or the kingdom of God? Look back on how in the world could I become an American who was Christian over a Christian who was American? And I don't think that in being called to God's kingdom, we're called to be poor citizens or anything. Uh, we were driving on the way here. It wasn't like uh, we saw the speed limit and said 30. It's like, psych, we're not Americans. We're citizens of God's kingdom. We're going 50. It's not that. I think God calls us to be great citizens. I think God calls us uh, to respect and pray for the leaders that are in place in our nation. But to the same extent, what matters not is the furthering of America, the betterment of America, but what matters is that the kingdom of God is continued and spread across the whole globe because he wants to save everyone, not just one country. He calls us to so much more than just being citizens of America. He's calling us to be citizens of his kingdom. May we live into that, the citizens of God's kingdom over anything else, which calls us then into being great citizens. The second part, and, and religious bigotry, it's just such strong, strong words, and we can take in such an, a number of ways. And I've taken it in different ways before, but what I think is kind of defining this is that Jonah was pretty sure he had God figured out. Uh, and what's happening, you know, you go back to Israel, it's like, okay, you're doing great right now. Well, if we're doing great, God's blessing us. We're not really doing anything. Well, it's like God's my own little personal pez dispenser. It's like, hey, 
we need a blessing, let's go to this pest dispenser, God, get the candy out, we're good. And I think what Jonah suffered with was having God just in this little box contained right here where he was supposed to be. That this was what God did, and he can't affect any of this other stuff. You know, this patriotism that's happening in Jonah's life, this uh, <laughs> something else going on if you can't you know, witness in this way. God's right here, he can't touch this. And I hope and I pray that we don't get like that. I hope and I pray <clears throat> that we never think that God can just be confined in this little space because he wants all of us, not just little parts of us. I remember with being called to ministry at age 10, I was still trying to figure out what it meant to like fit in. And so the whole time, I'm like, you know what? I just want to look like everyone else, fit in with everyone else. I started to grow my hair out that summer because I wanted to look like other people. I wanted to look nice because other people look nice for the evening services of the children's camp I was going to. So I was like, sisters, come help me out. I had two older sisters and two younger sisters and brothers, the youngest, but big family. Uh, but thankfully, I had two older sisters who were so excited to pick out my clothes. And I was like, yes, I'll fit in so much. And that's what I want God to enable me to do. I was like, God, can you just enable me to be ordinary? I was like, I can do this. You can help me and we'll figure it out. <laughs> and that camp, go there. And one of the last nights that we're there, he's like, what are you trying to do right now? You're just trying to fit in? He's like, you think I can just help you with that? He's like, no, I've called you to so much more. And I think God calls each of us to so much more than what we can expect from him. I think God wanted to, <laughs> in this passage, I think God wanted to impact us. A nation other than Israel here. He wanted it to reach the world. It just shows that. That God wasn't confined right here. He wanted all of it. <laughs> and in our lives, we cannot just confine God and expect Him to be in one area because He wants all of us. And while we may have expectations for Him, the expectations He has for us is so much greater. And He calls us to so much greater. And He enables us to be so much greater. I received my, that first call at age 10. I was like, God, I have no idea how I'm going to ever stand in front of people and talk for more than 10 minutes. I think I've hit 25 now. I'm not sure I've kept track. But he enables us. And he doesn't call us to something and just leave us there, but he leaves us there, but he enables us as well. And so for us, I think we need to live out those three things to resist what it is to be struck with selfish patriotism and religious bigotry, but to live out the great commandment, the great compassion, and the great commission to love people, all people, unconditionally, to forgive all people unconditionally, and to serve and witness to all people unconditionally. Can we bow your heads and pray with me? Dear God, may we live that out this week. May we not just hear this and think, that's great, let's turn the football game on, or that's great, I'm taking a nap now. Uh, but may we continue to work this out in our minds today and exactly how we're going to live it out. In the days and weeks, months, years to come, may we show this. May we go to the community that we're living within and show them what it means that we're going to love them, forgive them, and serve and witness to them. May we live these things out this week in your name that we pray.
Shane for coming from all of that Nazarene University. You represented the university very well. And uh, you may wonder well, why we have a preaching ambassador come every year uh, for the, this week of September. Well, part of it is because Pastor Will and I are gone at a fall workshop um, the week prior. But the main reason is because our very own Pastor Will served as a preaching ambassador when he was a college student at all of that. And so this is something very near and dear to Pastor Will. Heart, and I'm, I'm grateful that we get to see uh, young college students who are 22 years old wearing dinosaur socks come and deliver the word to us. And we also get to see them grow as we've seen our own pastor will grow in, in his ministry here. And so, thank you, thank you for coming. As, as we close out the service, uh, I, uh, you were talking about selfish patriotism and religious bigotry. Very strong words for us. My mind was drawn to the passage of Genesis chapter 12, where God said to Abram, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Why? And you will be a blessing. See, that is the call of the church. God has blessed us. God has blessed the country that we reside in. But he has done so, so that we might be a blessing to the whole world. And God continues on to Abram, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Would you stand and receive the blessing? Here at First Naz. You don't have to, but we just ask you to put your hand out like this as a symbolic way of receiving the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. And would you, as the people of God, leave this place a blessed people so that you might be a blessing to your communities into this world. Amen. You are dismissed. Go in peace.